Um, all right. So, Julie Scardina. Uh, I started at the parks. I'm not going to tell you the year because it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> but I was only six. No. <laughs> um, I, it was a long time ago. I've been working for the parks for well over 30 years. I uh, was a trainer for my, the whole first part of my, um, my employment, but it's basically been my life. Um, I started at Sea Lion and Otter, which I loved, and I worked with those animals for a couple of years and then um, went over to the whale stadium, got to work with killer whales, and then since that time, basically, I have worked with just about every uh, family of animals that we probably have in our SeaWorld and Bush Gardens parks. Um, in, um, in the mid-90s, I actually became the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Animal Ambassador, which really gave me a great um, opportunity to um, participate not only um, doing segments like with Jack Hanna and, and do some um, educational pieces in the media and all that, but um, I also began to travel a lot more. So I had the opportunity to travel to, and, and since then I've been to basically every continent, including Antarctica. So I've got some uh, great stories about being in Antarctica and seeing the penguins there as well. But um, so. I really, really, really became uh, very passionate about conservation throughout that period of time as well. And I am on the board of the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund. And now I just try to do whatever I can to raise awareness uh, about um, conservation and animals and get people excited and enthused and inspired to, um, I, I think, you know, even most recently, I've really kind of pinpointed what it is because there are so many people who love animals. I mean, almost everybody considers themselves an animal lover. But I really feel like there's so much more that animals need from us than just loving them. They need us to know about them. They need us to be experts about not only their species, but also about the earth and how we can all continue to live together on it. So. I think we need to move from being simply animal lovers to being conservationists. And I think that's a really important progression that we need to convey. Um, and, and that's kind of what um, I think is super important now. And that's where I think that um, SeaWorld really has the ability because of the fact that we've got people who not only love animals but have an expertise in caring for them and in understanding the bigger picture so that they can not only care uh, at the highest level for the animals that we have here at the park, but also help animals out in the wild. And that has occurred in so many different ways in so many different places that uh, I bet you most of you probably don't know. I, I think everybody here probably realizes that we rescue and rehab animals, right? But how many of you knew that um, a few years ago there was a colony of flamingos um, in South America that a jaguar ran through? And all the adults obviously took off. But there were chicks on the ground. There were eggs and chicks on the ground. Well, the people there didn't know what to do. All the adults had left, and now they've got these chicks. And there were hundreds of them, and the eggs as well. So we, as a zoological facility, who had raised flamingo chicks before, um, along with other experts who had done the same, went down there, and we helped raise the eggs and the chicks until the point where they could be reintroduced and returned back to the wild. That couldn't have been done unless you were an expert, unless you had hands-on experience in doing that. All of those chicks would have died. All of those eggs would not have hatched. And that type of scenario has played out time and time again in different ways and different with different stories. I think many of you probably know about the, um, the largest uh, in terms of numbers of animal um, rescues that has occurred that I know of to date, which was off the coast of South Africa in, in 2000, in the year 2000. And there were 20,000 adult penguins that were affected by an oil spill down there. And people from all over the world responded. And it was amazing because they set up these big warehouses and they had to um, actually go through steps, you know, where 20,000 penguins had to be 
uh, stabilized, they had to be cleaned, they had to be, uh, you know, made sure that they were eating and, and they were doing well before they, and, and of course the oil had to be cleaned up before they could be re-released again. Same type of scenario where um, this was breeding season and there were over 700 chicks left on the island where these penguins had um, the oil spill off of. When our SeaWorld aviculturists went down there, they said, hey, we raise penguins. We know exactly how to care for those chicks. We could go out there and go get those chicks. They rounded up all those chicks, 700 chicks. And I remember, um, I, I'm pretty good friends with one of the aviculturists who went down there. And um, she, uh, she wrote me, and, you know, emailed me or whatever, and basically said, my arms are black and blue because these chicks, you know, they don't know that somebody's helping them, but they're having to be force fed basically to keep them alive. They're having to do this hour, you know, I mean, literally it was by the time you went through 700 chicks, you were starting over again because they have to eat several times a day. This is not just a once a day thing. So basically they would just start through 700 chicks and go through 700 chicks, but they raised those chicks up and they released those chicks in groups with the adults so that the adults could show them where to go. And they also um, banded many of these animals that they both rehabbed uh, with the oil and the chicks that they uh, raised up. And it was really discovered that it was a total successful operation, that most of those birds survived, and that most of those birds grew up and then ended up, you know, to this date, having chicks of their own. So, I mean, it's a, just a super success story, and it's just amazing that we have the expertise to be able to help in situations like that where, you know, unless, unless you really have that experience, you can love animals all you want, but you better know how to take care of them. And, and frankly, you know, I, again, there, there are a lot of people who I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, are, are very critical of us right now. And, and I'm sure they're animal lovers as well. But when it comes to a rescue that needs to happen, you don't pick up the phone and call an animal lover. You pick up the phone and you call an expert that can go out there and save that animal's life. And that's what we're able to do at SeaWorld. So that's kind of a lot of talking on my part. <laughs> um, why don't I, you know, kind of just take questions from you guys, because I'm sure you have a lot of different questions. And there's even kids, and I'd love to take questions from the kids as well. How long do penguins live? How long do penguins live? You know, there are 18 different kinds of penguins, first of all, right? So there, yeah. Well, you know what the biggest one is? Well, I, I hold my hand up because, you know, but it's like about three foot tall. The emperor penguin, you're absolutely right. So those are the biggest species. And they can live, um, you know, in our parks we have emperor penguins that are in their 40s. So they can live pretty long. And then there are littler penguins, and the ones that we have at SeaWorld, we have smaller ones that are called like Adeli penguins, and we have, uh, we have Gentoo penguins. Those guys usually live um, probably in their 20s would be average. Usually, again, in the wild, it's a much harder life. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been to Antarctica, and I, I tell you, it was very eye-opening. You know, I mean, I loved it. I went down there during chick season for the emperor penguin. So I went down there and I saw these adorable little chicks. So those are my pictures up there, okay? So um, I saw some that were really young. And I'm going to tell you some of the story, too, because um, if they were old enough and they were still getting fed, like, like let's say the, the furthest um, left picture, that, that chick is probably... Um, the baby's out of the mama. That, yeah, you see the baby? You see the baby in between the... the you, you know, you think that's the mom and the dad, but there were a lot of chicks who were sidling up to adults who basically said, you're not my chick, get out of here. And there were a lot of little ones that were walking around looking for mom and dad. I don't know exactly how that worked because there were, I mean, little guys like this, uh, that, that, that bottom picture, I mean, look at this guy is tiny. He's walking around, he's this tall, and he's just, and they walk hundreds of yards. And I'm like, how do, they, how do they know where to go to find their parents? How do the parents know where to go? And they're going up to almost any adult that they can find. Like this little group of chicks over here, they all crowded around that.
that adult. <laughs> oh, that, that adult is not the mom or dad to all those chicks. You know, they only have one. So, uh, but they're but they're really kind of like, hey, if you'll take me, if you'll feed me, I I'm gonna eat from you because it's a very fine line between life and death for those animals. And and I really saw that when I was out there, that it's a harsh place. And uh, and and like I said, in all my travels, I've seen that, um, you know. What happens out in the wild is not easy. You know, if you, if you don't work the hardest you can possibly work, if you're not at the top of your game, you're not going to survive to the next day. I mean, it, it is as simple as that. It's a harsh life out there. So it was cool going out there and seeing uh, the, the adults and the chicks and all that, but I also learned a lot about the fact of, you know, penguins are having a hard time all over the world. Um, out of that 18 species that I talked about earlier, 13 of them are in decline. Mm -hmm. And the declines are happening for a variety of reasons. They're happening because uh, um, there's oil spills uh, throughout, the, and sometimes it's just oil contamination, uh, like off the coast of uh, South America for the Magellanic penguins. There's an estimated 40,000 that don't make it every year because they're covered with oil. 40,000. Uh, there's also fishing that happens, and if the fishermen are out there, they're competing with uh, the penguins for food. Well, the penguins are competing with the fishermen, basically, because the fishermen can take all they want, unless there are regulations. So if there's fishing happening, they have to go way further in order to get resources to feed their chicks. And if you're only feeding your chick once, uh, you know, half as often as you normally would because you have to go twice as far to find food, it's going to make it a lot harder for that chick to survive as well. So there are a lot of things that I talk about when, um, even in the show, you know, that we can do to help make sure that we're helping animals survive. And, and some of those things just have to do with being aware of the fact that, um, that we have an impact on wildlife and wild places. And knowing that it takes... Uh, even just a bit of sacrifice on our part. And if we each did a bit of sacrifice, there's about 7 billion people on the planet, if we each sacrifice just a little bit more, we'll leave them a little bit more. And then there are ways that we can focus on things just like we did with the bald eagle, with the peregrine falcon, with the American alligator, with a lot of different species on the planet that we have brought back from being uh, very... Uh, threatened with extinction basically to the point where they're doing very very well now so if we do pay attention we can make that difference and and really that's what it comes down to so awareness knowing what action needs to be taken and knowing how to take that action and then uh, and then being able to realize that with that we want to survive and coexist with these animals on the planet good question Julie, can you tell us about wild days? What is it about? Yeah, Wild Days, it's, you know, it's a great weekend. I mean, it, it's each weekend for a month period of time, and um, it, it's going to be different every weekend. I was really happy to be able to participate again because it really is an opportunity for us to reach out of where we normally exist, which is within the park, and talk about issues that are bigger and go out further than ourselves. So on my weekend, you know, with, with the fact that people love penguins, we thought we'd focus on that a little bit more. Last year... Uh, I did penguin lovers, and I didn't focus as much on penguins, and this year I was like, no, you have to focus more on penguins. So we have a really cool surprise at the end of the show that I bring out. So if you guys are all going to be uh, at this next show, then you'll be really surprised by what comes out at the end of the show because it's really special. Um, but uh, other than that, you know, there's um, Bindi Irwin who comes and really reaches out to kids because, again, you know, that just that awareness. And kids are very aware these days of the fact that, uh, again, you know, they, they, love, they love the idea of, of animals and nature and all that. But I think in a lot of cases, we're not necessarily getting their hands dirty. Uh, and, and they don't quite know what to do with that, with that passion that they have. And I think that um, Bindi and, and some of our sites like um, Generation Nature uh, give you ideas of what to do so that kids can go out and actually make a difference by physically doing something. And so, you know, a few of the different weekends are, are different. Jack Hanna will be here, obviously, and he's always a hoot. One of my good friends that I used to travel with a lot, and uh, it's great when I see him off and on. We're, we're actually doing the same Wild Days weekend together in San Diego in March. So um, I, I really love Wild Days because, like I said, it really kind of brings to 
light so much that's going on in our planet regarding animals and wild, wildlife. What other questions? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more like about, I think people aren't even really aware of the conservation fund, um, some of the projects that that actually gets involved in. Great question. So the question was about our conservation fund and what types of projects we support with our conservation fund. So um, it started in 2003, and the, there were four areas that we determined that we wanted to um, to focus on basically, even though those four areas encompass a lot of different things. But the four areas are uh, conservation education. Um, we've talked a little bit about the fact that it really is important that youth are aware of what is necessary in order to, um, in order to continue to support the wildlife and the habitats and the environment that we have today, which is, which is obviously very different even than it was years ago. So that is not just in the United States. That is an important concept all around the world. Uh, I've been to Africa, and um, we took a group of kids out into a national park right outside of a place where they lived in a village. But those kids had never seen a giraffe never seen the zebras because they lived outside the national park and what the animals that they saw were usually in conflict with so if they ever saw a lion it was a bad thing just like if you saw a lion in your backyard it would be a bad thing you know um, so that's how they viewed wildlife as i don't want that wildlife to come near me but going out into the national park and being able to see the beauty and how these animals live and, and how important they are in their own country to tourism and just the balance of nature there, they were able to get an appreciation for nature that they really never had had before. And some of those kids are going to be the leaders, uh, the future leaders of their country. And so that understanding and appreciation for nature is important no matter what country uh, you come from. So that's one area. Um, we also support um, uh, habitat protection. So obviously habitat loss and degra degradation is a, um, a huge issue all across the globe. Um, so many places that used to have beautiful forests are now down to just fragmented uh, little segments of it. Um, uh, an animal called the, um, called the uh, cotton top tamarind. Has anybody heard of the cotton top tamarind? Okay, it's an adorable little, I mean, they're, they're monkeys that are this big, right? Yeah. And so the cotton top tamarind used to live um, all across Colombia in, in all the different forests that they had. But Colombia has continued to grow. Uh, there's more people, there's more development. And now the cotton top tamarind only lives in literally a handful of small fragments. And sometimes they're just completely surrounded by farmland, agriculture, because that's how, uh, that's how the, um, the country generates some of, their, um, some of their income. So luckily there are people, and even that we support through, uh, through organizations there, Proyecto Titi is the name of one of the organizations, and they are not only doing science in these small fragments to see how the populations of cotton top tamarinds are doing, but they also are um, engaging with the local people to, um, to protect those last small fragments and to keep them clean and not to, t not to uh, tear them down, basically, not to uh, um, bulldoze them down so that the last of the cotton top tamarind um, habitat isn't available anymore. So uh, that's working because they are providing, the cotton top tamarinds are providing some income to the folks because of tourism, but it's also, uh, we've, we've uh, uh, engaged with them uh, to create some, some <coughs> products that they can sell to other people. And because they know that we're helping to support that marketing and, and that sales of some of those products, that they realize that there's a value to having those animals and being associated with those animals. And frankly, uh, Colombia is the only place on the earth where cotton top tamarinds live, so there's a pride. Once they know about it, that goes along with that as well. And then the people feel good about, okay, I want to keep our cotton top tamarinds as well. So, habit, so we've gotten uh, conservation education, habitat protection. We also do species research, whether it's uh, both marine and uh, terrestrial. It's important. 
Like we do a lot of research here in, in the parks. We partner with universities and with uh, government agencies and with um, private researchers to do research here. It's important to also support research that is happening out in the wild. Uh, a lot of people think that we already know everything we need to know about animals. And you know what? That is so far from the truth you wouldn't believe it. We know so little about most species on this planet. We don't even know what the species are in many cases, right? You know, we're still discovering species on this planet. So to be able to support researchers who are out there in the field um, or doing studies that potentially help an endangered species uh, is really, really important. And then lastly, we also support uh, rescue and rehab around the world. So you guys probably know we, we rescue uh, animals on a daily basis, and we've rescued over 24,000 animals um, since we first started uh, the SeaWorld parks. There are people across the globe who are doing the same, but do not have the resources that we have. So part of our fund also supports rescue, people who do rescue and rehab work in other parts of the world um, so that whether it's uh, whether it's um, dolphins uh, and, and other marine life, or whether it's um, elephants, or whether it's uh, chimpanzees or bonobos, that we are supporting that work as well. So those are four really important areas. They, they encompass a lot. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and so we read about 450 or so projects every year. And I commit myself to reading those projects because I think it's super important. It's probably, I would say, the most gratifying part of my job is to be able to give uh, support to organizations that are doing great work. It's also the hardest part of my job because we can't support all 450 of those applications. So it's the hardest part to have to determine which ones get support and which ones don't. Thank great you. question. Thank you. Yes? All right, um, actually, oh, we're... Yeah, we've got about two minutes before they're about to ready to open the doors, so we need to make this the last one. Okay. Darn, I was having a good time with you guys. <laughs> you know what? If you guys want, uh, if you guys have other questions after the show, we can, um, it, you know, if you want, just come back down here. I have to do a little bit of a meet and greet, but so you'd have to stay until after the meet and greet. But if you have questions, um, we can, I can certainly answer those. So one more. Go ahead. There you go, sweetheart. The little, yeah, little yep. girl in pink. Yep. Uh, what's your favorite type of penguin? What's my favorite type of penguin? Oh, that's a hard question. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? I would probably have to say the emperor penguin. Just because they are so amazing and they're so special, and they are the ones that live in the harshest of conditions. They have their chicks in the... <laughs> worst time of year that you would think why would any species want to have their chicks in the winter in the cold when it's really windy and how does that work but you know what it's because they're there to protect the egg and the protect so that the chick has the best chance of surviving once spring starts coming and there's opportunity for that chick to survive at the highest level so the parents actually go through the worst of the struggles during the worst time of year just so that their chicks have the best chance to survive. And that's pretty cool to me. And actually, you know what? Pretty much all animals are like that. You know, the, the parents uh, of pretty much all animals make incredible sacrifices, in, including humans, obviously. Uh, and, and, and that's pretty, um, I mean, you know, it just kind of hits you here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess that was it, huh? Yes, thank okay. You, All right, thank you guys. It was fun talking thank with you. you. All right, everybody. So the reserve seats for